Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, St. Giles Presbyterian Church in Prince George. Uh, we welcome all of you uh, worshiping online with us and the uh, people that are doing the service here today. Uh, we uh, are here to worship God and so um, as far as I know there are no announcements uh, and so the uh, call to worship I am reading a prayer uh, from a book called prayers of grace surrender to the grace of a loving God give up your worries and concerns your fears and your doubts to a God that cares and won't let you down Turn over your challenges and obstacles to a God who makes your way clear and smooth again. When life becomes a struggle, give up the fight and give in to the grace of a power greater and wiser than yourself. And so we'll come before God in prayer. Thank you for the opportunity, Father, to gather virtually and those that are here this morning. We thank you for the gifts for those that make all of this possible. Bless our time together today, and may it enrich and enlighten those listening and be pleasing to you. This we ask in Christ's name. And uh, as far as... Uh, I'll continue now into the prayers of the people. I won't uh, name all of the uh, individual people. Uh, I will just include them in the prayer this morning. So let's pray for God's people. For by grace we have been saved through faith, a gift from you, for which we are grateful. Your grace and strength lift us up and carry us forward. Clement of Alexandria said, the all-sufficient physician of humanity, the Savior, heals both body and soul. And so this morning we ask your healing for Dr. Lim recovering at home. Harry and Barb, uh, as he awaits surgery and cancer treatment over the next several months. Dennis, Walter's friend, preparing for prostate surgery. Mohan, Tabitha's brother, sick with cancer. Marie, Dean's mum, recovering from surgery. Garnet, recovering at home. Caroline, recovering at home. And Tristan. We pray for Linda's niece and her boyfriend diagnosed with COVID-19 and others struggling with this disease, and we pray for their speedy recovery. We pray for those being screened and tested for COVID. Grant them your peace as they await their results. There is comfort only you can provide. Your comfort holds us in your strong and caring arms. We ask you to be with Elda's uh, family uh, in the passing of her Aunt Betty. We ask that you would be with Barbara, Derek, and her children. We ask that you would be with Elda's uncle Don's family in his recent passing. Uplift and encourage and strengthen all these people. And we pray for our world. Be with our congregation in our ongoing search process for a new minister. Thank you for the efforts of the committee and speak to the heart of the person you have called to the position. Grant wisdom, discernment, integrity to governments worldwide dealing with the COVID and the vaccine rollout. Bless and comfort all who daily see pain and desperation as a part of their job. Bless the police, first responders, doctors, nurses, and all caretakers. Send your strength to restore them. 
Strengthen and encourage the lonely, the anxious, and those with COVID fatigue. Grant them your patience and your love. Heavenly Father, we offer these prayers to you, those that we have voiced this morning and those that we have said in the silence of our hearts. Give us strength to wait patiently for your answer. And now we offer the Lord's Prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Uh, this is the second Sunday of Lent, and if you joined us last week, you'd know that this Lent at St. Giles, we're focusing on crosses. Last week, I talked to you about the colors of the church changing and this Latin cross that's now in our sanctuary. Uh, this week, I want to talk to you about a cross that belongs in my house. Uh, it is a budded cross. Uh, you can see that because of the three buds on each of the arms. Each of these buds can represent the Trinity. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, this cross can also be called the Apostle's Cross because of the 12 discs at the end. When it was originally made, it was made with gemstones on each of the buds, and there was a gemstone in the center, which symbolized Christ. You can also find crosses like this one, where the buds look even more like buds from a tree, and that is to represent um, growth and blossoming in your faith. Um, this particular cross is special to me because Many years ago, my mother bought two crosses, and they're both made out of uh, olive wood from Jerusalem. And she gave one, this one, to a family friend named Marion, um, where she hung it above her piano in her house, where I spent many, many hours of my childhood. Um, unfortunately, Marion passed away about five years ago, and so when my mom was asked about this cross, she decided to take it and to bring it to me as a gift to help me remember Marion by. Um, this gift, this cross not only reminds me of the gift of salvation given to us through the cross, but it also reminds me of Marion, uh, a woman who taught and showed me how to be a Christian to those in our lives. Uh, this cross also reminds me of my own mother, um, and it reminds me of how she shows her friends and her church community Christian love. Uh, we would like to invite uh, each of you to look around your house and your lives and find crosses. Maybe it's a necklace, uh, maybe it's a cross and a picture and a drawing, or a design of a cross that intrigues you. Um, we would love for somebody new to come share next week about a cross that they have found that helps them remember the reason of uh, this season of Lent that we're currently in. On this second Sunday of Lent, let us join in the Lenten reading. We are not the first to make the journey to Jerusalem. Many have gone before us, and many will come after us. From near and far, God's people gathered to celebrate God's goodness on the holy mountain. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus often went to Jerusalem as a child to celebrate Passover. Now he has set his face towards Jerusalem again, knowing this time will be different. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Jesus' last journey to Jerusalem is somber. He has no illusions about what is to come. 
Still, he goes ahead, doing God's will. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Let us pray. God, God of, of light, light we, we want, want to follow in Jesus' footsteps. footsteps. But, but we, we have, have our fears and doubts. We would, we would rather avoid the pain and darkness, and darkness on, on our journey. journey. Give, Give us courage and perseverance when the, the journey is difficult and the grace to help others on the road. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our 
feeble frame he knows In his hands he gently bears us Rescues us from all our foes Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him Widely as his mercy flows Frail as summer's flowery flourish Blows the wind and it is gone But while mortals rise and perish God endures unchanging on Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him Praise the high eternal one Angels help us to adore him Ye behold him face to face Sun and moon bow down before him Dwellers all in time and space Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him Praise with us the God of grace. The scripture readings this morning, the first one is from the Gospels, Matthew 28, verses 1 to 16. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Lo, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell your br brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders, and taken counsel, they gave a sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this is the story that has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. The second reading is from the Old Testament, uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 to 15. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, 
when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepared what they when they what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of this land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your murmurings against the Lord. For what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread for the full, because the Lord has heard your murmurings, which you murmur against him, what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your murmurings. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the murmurings of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay round about the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as hoarfrost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, friends. It's great to be with you at St. Giles in Prince George. I'm happy to Alan Yee for the invitation to be your guest preacher for this second Sunday of Lent. Friends, let's bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, grant us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the title for my sermon this morning is something like, Grace, Go Figure. Uh, we're Presbyterians. Isn't grace a good thing? Then why does it create grumbling, outrage, anger, a, a union grievance in our story for this morning? In church, we sing all about grace, praise with us the God of grace and God of grace and God of glory and amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace is a beautiful idea, a wonderful concept. By grace, you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That confession is at the very core of Christianity. Uh, through the merits of Jesus Christ, not our own credentialed history, our own impressive CV and demonstrated competence. No, it's through grace that God lavishes upon us the gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and new life in Jesus' name. Uh, only faith can take that in. Uh, this favor's never earned, it's just accepted, uh, like the elements at Holy Communion with empty hands. We can breathe again, we can live again, what we cannot do for ourselves, God does, and we have life. Grace colors everything we say at church. We're immersed in grace. It surrounds everything we do and say. Theoretically, grace is a central idea, an essential concept, the absolutely necessary ingredient in our Protestant confession of faith. We believe in justification by grace alone. Friends, we'll leave the service today after we hear something like, and now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now 
and always, we believe in grace, don't we? Well, we believe in grace until we read stories like the one from Matthew for this morning. In this story, grace is not a lucid notion or a Protestant talisman. What we see in this story is grace embodied awkwardly at work. In a real-life situation, grace among grapes. And look what happens when grace intrudes into the workaday world. We meet an eccentric employer whose, gen whose generosity is way off. His payday policy breaks the connection between work and reward. That's not easy for we Presbyterians to take. We believe in the Protestant work ethic. And then for prophetic types, well, we'd circulate a petition. We'd start a union over these vineyard economics. But what's he doing? Equal pay for unequal work? That's not fair. That's an outrage. Well, early in the day, noticing that the crops are ready to be harvested, the landowner takes his truck to the local manpower center. It's harvest time and everybody needs laborers. That's why this vineyard owner gets there early and contracts with the up first thing in the morning laborers for a good wage, a denarius for a day's work. And the eager workers, the good boys, load into the truck and get dropped off at the vineyard. They, they know what to do. They, they know how to work a full day. Well, as the day wears on, the owner of the winery sees that, well, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. So it goes back to, let's say, Kelowna, this time not to the manpower center, but to the main street where, where there might be some stragglers on benches, guys milling around who might want some work. A group loads into the truck with the simple assurance that, well, whatever is right, I'll give you. At 9 a.m., the second group trundles off to the vineyard. But still, even with these two toiling groups of workers, it's not enough. The harvest is good. The grapes are ripe. It's now or never. So Mr. Vineyard Owner is back in his Ford 150 into town at noon and then again at three in the afternoon. You can imagine the workers you get that late in the day. These are the riffraff, the fellows who slept in, the effects of last night's just wearing off, the aspirin starting to take effect late in the afternoon. They, they jump in, why not? What could they lose? The promise of a fair wage is good enough. Finally, with just one hour left in the workday, a last group of men is required to finish it off. All that's left at this late hour are the idlers, the loafers, the up at the crack of dawn, no, noon types. They think, what the heck, it's only an hour before dark. Maybe we can make enough for a magnum or a joint now that it's legal. They jump into the truck. Somebody's probably going to have to show these guys how to pick grapes. By the time you get started picking, you know, it's just going to be 45 minutes till pay time. These guys are practiced at uh, minimal investments of energy. You know, late starts and early finishes, that's their game. Well, the whistle blows, the shift is over. Nothing to harvest now but the uh, day's wages. The landowner says to the accounting department, uh, Hey, 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 bring me the last ones first. Got that? The last ones first. I I'm serious. Now, this is where our story takes its unexpected twist. The day-long laborers, the guys who are always up at 6 a.m., and have you ever noticed that people who get up at 6 a.m. never tire of telling other people they get up at 6 a.m.? In any case, uh, these guys, they think, well, I guess he can pay these latecomers from the petty cash. Let's hand out the loonies and toonies first. Well, the loafers have worked only one hour. But the envelope is chock full, no change, all bills, one full day's wage. They're thrilled. And the news spreads like wildfire to the back of the line. The guys who came at three are doing the multiplication. Let's see, we work two more hours than the latecomers, a full day's pay for each hour. This could be interesting. But they, they get the same as the guys who just put in an hour. The Smiles fade. Uh, there must be some mistake. This can't be right. There's confusion, a miscalculation, and maybe a clerical error. But no, the, the crew that came at noon and the nine o'clock folks also get one Daenerys. Hmm. You mean he's going to pay everyone the same regardless of how much work? This is ridiculous. This is unbelievable. With muttering in the background, the guys who have never missed a day's work in their lives line up. Now, the difference between 1 and 12 hours is so great that there's no way the pay can be the same. 
or can it? They get one denarius. The Bible says uh, they grumbled. That's shorthand for what they really said. We're, we're choice workers. We've been here all day. We worked through the heat and lunch hour. The others didn't even break a sweat. And yet you, Mr. Mr. Owner, you with your silhouette on the wine bottle, you treat us like them, exactly like the latecomers. What, what about seniority, advanced standing, work done, results achieved? Well, sitting there on the veranda, sipping a nice Syrah, Mr. Jackson Triggs says, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't we shake on a denarius? And if you look in the envelope, what do you see? Is it a denarius? Yes, is the angry answer. Well, then why should it bother you if I choose to be to be generous? Don't give me the hairy eyeball, the, the one that's always fixed on fairness. I can do what I want with what's mine. And why do you high achieving up at the crack of dawn work through your lunch, guys? Why do you get so upset about generosity all the time? What, what do you think? It's your vineyard? Take your denarius, get out of here, and by the way, have a nice day. Well, whatever else you might say about this owner, you can bet that tomorrow morning nobody's showing up at six o'clock. He subverted the vineyard economy, encouraged laziness with his equal pay for unequal work. You can only break that link once. He's lost his leverage in the vineyard. No one's going to show up a whole day long under an indiscriminate reign of generosity. Are they? And yet this parable begins. The kingdom of heaven is like. Like an eccentric landowner, God, who rewards every worker, disciple, with the same wage. It's a story told by Peter, who asked Jesus, what's in it for us? What do we get us inner circle up at the crack of dawn, disciples? What do, what do we get? What will be our compensation? As he stands there with Jesus, anticipating reward for his day-long labor, maybe Peter's thinking, surely we have been with him since the beginning of the day will be rewarded more than everybody else. Clearly, it can't be the case that those who have served long and hard in the Father's vineyard are going to get the same as people who suddenly got scared and turned to faith. Surely, Jesus can't be saying that for all our years of service, there will be no gold watch. That's the way God treats laborers, treats us. If that's the economy of discipleship, who's going to work in the Father's vineyard? Does this mean that people who work the whole day long are going to be compensated for their efforts in the same way as the thief on the cross who arrived at the vineyard as the day ended? It's, it's not fair. If people who squeak into the kingdom of heaven get a full day's pay, then those who have been working the fields all day long, what do they get? Well, they get stiffed, stomach trouble. Well, placed within the work and reward dynamic, it isn't fair. But maybe Jesus is telling us the point of the story is the whole work reward mentality doesn't really work when it comes to the church. Perhaps Peter and every disciple who thinks like it's got it wrong, graded compensation, hierarchy, years served, seniority, none of it works in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Eugene Lauer, a preacher, offers some help with this story. He says, now I want you to imagine that you are the parent of three children three, six, and nine years of age. Do you love the nine-year-old three times as much as the three-year-old? Because, of course, the eldest has been three times as much help around the house. You are a nine-year-old. Do you love your parents three times as much as when you were three? Why, you say, that's ridiculous. We're family. So is the story. Jesus was talking about a family covenant. Simon Peter thought it was more like a business deal. You see, every time we think of membership in the Christian family in terms of recognition and graded compensation, well, we kind of distort what it means to belong to a family. Our way of life as those who've been called to labor in the Father's vineyard is based on God's grace and our gratitude. The parable starts off with landowners and laborers, but ends up looking more like a parent with a family because that's a better way to think about God and the church. A woman being interviewed on television was one of those heroic mothers who raised a large family single-handedly. 
She not only raised them, but they were all successful, each having made a remarkable achievements in their work. It was a great story. Well, in an attempt to get at some formula, some rule that could apply in order to have similar success with their families, the equitable interviewer said, I suppose you, uh, you love them all the same, uh, making sure they all got the same treatment. The mother said, I love them. I love them all, each of them, but not equally. I love the one who was down until he was up. I love the one who was weak until he was strong. I love the one that was lost until she was found. The kingdom of God is like a mother who loves all their, her children according to their need and loves them until they become who they were created to be. It's like that sometimes. Ordinary rules are put aside and the first are last and the last are first. In another way, the mother, like the landowner in the parable, uh, gave all of her children the same thing herself. And that, too, is a message of our parable. All laborers in the Father's vineyard get the same thing. In a little book entitled Final Testimonies, the last thoughts and writings of the Swiss theologian Karl Barth are gathered. In one interview on French radio, the interviewer asked this great theologian in the final days of his accomplished life, Who's Jesus Christ for you? A great mind, a committed man, a Christian who raised opposition to the Nazis, a lifetime of serious and hard work for the church behind him. Karl Barth answered this, Jesus Christ is for me precisely what he was, is, and will always and everywhere be for everyone, the whole world. Now, could, could it be? that the landowner of our parable, God, gives all of his labor's disciples the same wage because this landowner gives just one gift to everybody, Jesus Christ. And this gift is always more than anyone deserves, and it can only ever be given like everything at once. Friends, grace means we don't get what we deserve. We get Jesus. And who could ask for anything more? Amen. And now to Jesus Christ, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests of his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word. As long as life endures, genes are gone, I've been set free, 
my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun will bear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever mine. You are forever. pray for the offering this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this time of worship that you've given to us. And this last song, Lord God, we just heard uh, and th that we sung together, Lord God, asks, asks you, Lord, that, that whatever we do, that you would use us, that you would um, use us for, to further your kingdom. And Heavenly Father, as we uh, pray for the offering this morning, Lord God, we give thanks uh, to you for your blessings. We give thanks, Lord God, to those who have been giving their tithes and their, their offerings during this time of COVID. And we pray for the offering, Lord God, that you would use it, that you would use it so that uh, your work be done, that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, 
that we as St. Giles Presbyterian Church, Lord God, would be going forth into this world, into our city. That you would use us mightily for your work. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord God, that you would be with us as a community, um, that even though we are um, not together physically, that we meet online and that we are one in spirit because of your love and because of your sacrifice. Hear our prayers, Lord God, this morning we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. And so friends, as you go, wherever you are, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you from now until forever. Amen. Go in peace.